<laughs> okay, so um, hi, Shailish. Uh, it's David Bernstein. Um, we're going to start shortly. Um, we're trying to keep things more or less on time. So uh, I, I hope you're aware of the time limits. And if, if you start to go over, uh, I'll come in and, and tell you to rush to the end. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So we're very happy to have Shailish Chandra Sekran from Duke University. And he's going to tell us uh, about a simple QE regularization scheme for SUN lattice gauge theories. Um, go ahead. Uh, well, thanks uh, to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to tell you a bit about some of the work that we are doing. Um, the work is being done with uh, the Los Alamos group here, uh, Tanmoy Bhattacharya and Rajan Gupta. And it is an extension of um, a paper that I wrote with my student, Han Ching Liu, who is moving to Los Alamos um, maybe in, in a week. Uh, actually, he has a position there. Um, so um, I'd like to um, give you a bit of, of an outline of my talk. So what my plan is to give you a, a very quick motivation and then uh, review a bit about SU and Hamiltonian lattice gauge theories. And I think many, um, in fact, many youngsters are learning about this uh, very old approach to lattice gauge theories, um, which was, I guess, uh, goes back to even the beginnings of the whole lattice program. But then over the years, we have sort of moved away from it and learned a lot about the path integral approach, the Lagrangian approach to lattice gauge theories. But going back and remind, reminding ourselves of what SUN Hamiltonian approach to lattice gauge theories is a useful approach. Because um, essentially, everything is motivated uh, in this um, talk is that someday, hopefully, not very uh, uh, very much in the future, we might have some quantum computers and we would like to start using them to solve uh, lattice gauge theory problems. So I will uh, propose a, a simple qubit regularization scheme, which was actually invented by my um, student in the paper that I just mentioned. And it's a very interesting, simple approach, which is different from some of the things that we have done in the past, I'm sure Rich is aware of some of the ideas that we have developed on this long ago, but uh, this is slightly different and it's it seems to be more robust and interesting. And that's what I'm going to talk a bit about. Uh, and then I will actually uh, talk, of course, as usual, uh, go to the simplest case of one spatial dimension where without the matter fields, uh, everything has become, everything is almost trivial. Um, but then with matter fields, it becomes slightly more interesting. And then I will talk a bit about how this simple regularization actually helps us uh, characterize all gauge invariant space, which is quite interesting. And then I will talk a bit about higher dimensions where also uh, we can do a lot of simple things um, and hopefully lead to something interesting uh, in the future. And then I'll present some conclusions. <clears throat> So the motivation of the talk, of course, uh, comes from the fact that we would like to solve quantum field theories on a quantum computer, right? And for that, like what we did um, in the lattice regularization, where we took a continuum and put it on a lattice, we now have to go to um, the local Hilbert space and then make that finite dimensional. And that typically uh, is necessary even to think about formulating everything in terms of uh, qubits. So we call it the qubit regularization, exactly like regularizing the ultraviolet. This will be the regularization of uh, the local Hilbert space. Um, uh, of course, uh, the reason is mainly for bosonic degrees of freedom, where traditionally uh, you have an infinite dimensional local Hilbert space. For fermions, this is not in principle necessary because uh, you can think about fermions as coming from local spin half like degrees of freedom, except for some permutations which you can keep track of um, in, in your quantum circuits. But, um, but bosons are sort of fundamentally different in that sense. So qubit regularization is a way to preserve the symmetries of the original theory so that these finite dimensional local Hilbert spaces are sort of sufficient to still study the theory. So the idea is very similar to what we did in lattice gauge theories, 
So there is an RG perspective to the whole thing. So we are interested in some point in the whole space of all coupling constants in the Hamiltonian picture, let's say. Uh, this is where the quantum field theory emerges and there are some relevant directions and there are irrelevant directions. So in a lattice gauge, in a traditional lattice gauge theory, what we will do is we will scan the space through some convenient Hamiltonian. And then hopefully there will be a point where you will get through um, so that the, the correlation lengths become very large. And so you get what we call a quantum critical point. And then the long distance physics um, will be described close to that quantum critical point by the physics of this QFT. So continuum QFT is typically emerged near quantum critical points. So we are interested in lattice models which have quantum critical points. Now the whole idea about qubit regularization is that it's a new axis with finite dimensional Hilbert space. And again, the hope is that you have another quantum critical point which gives you the same physics um, as your original lattice theory. The main difference between this traditional theory and this qubit regularized theory is that the qubit regularized theory has a finite dimensional local Hilbert space. Now, if this is really true, can this be done is an interesting research question. And that's one of the challenges we'd like to explore. So we have to construct a Hamiltonian and a quantum critical point such that uh, this qubit regularized model uh, also leads to the quantum field theory of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, so a systematic way to construct such things uh, actually was proposed long ago in the late 1990s, uh, which we call the D-theory approach, right? And there are some review articles on that. And today I will talk a bit about a slightly different idea from this. Uh, which is not very different from this D theory approach, except that the regularization is slightly different. So uh, I will talk about SUN gauge theories, and um, and I will actually include matter in the fundamental representation. Of course, you can do a lot of things here. You can play with uh, different um, different regularizations and different types of matter fields. And here we're going to do the simplest one. Which now, of course, I should mention that what we are saying is not very different from many other work that is already there uh, in the literature by now, right? Um, but from my perspective, um, if I read through all these papers, the whole idea of qubit regularization is not obviously there. So it's, I'm sure, hidden some way or the other. Uh, so it'd be good to make some connection between what is being, what is being done and what we propose. Because in our case, I think we have a very concrete realization of a, of a finite dimensional Hamiltonian, which is gauge invariant, which has all the symmetries. And I'm sure many of these work uh, also are exactly in the same category, but some of these things are somehow hidden in that. So it'd be good to make some connection. Here. So let me quickly review uh, the ideas of, of uh, lattice gauge theory. Um, which uh, again is, should be familiar to many um, experts at least, but maybe the younger people in the audience could perhaps learn something. So when you construct a lattice gauge theory, you construct two types of Hilbert spaces. One is a local Hilbert space on each side that is where the matter lives. So here we will think about matter in the fundamental representation. So I'm going to think about especially fermions um, and so the dimension of the Hilbert space, if you have n uh, fundamental particles, right? And so it will be, the dimension will be two to the power n. And then on the gauge, um, the gauge fields live on links. And in the traditional uh, language, this Hilbert space is actually infinite dimensional. And this is what we will need regularization. So we can think about what the local Hilbert space for a gauge uh, for a gauge field is, right? Uh, as I told you, the matter field already is uh, sort of finite dimensional. So the Hilbert space can be characterized by the Fock vacuum, the, the fundamental particle, if you wish, and then two of those and so on up till you can put all the N of those that will become again a singlet from the perspective of SUN. 
So there'll be two singlet states, and then there'll be the remaining anti-symmetric representations of the fundamental uh, N representation. Now the gauge is, uh, of course, infinite dimensional, and one can think about um, the Hilbert space on the link as though there's a quantum mechanical particle that moves on the manifold of an SU N group, right? And that, that's the Hilbert space in the traditional formulation. And so one can think about a position basis where G is um, an element of SU N. And so you have the usual completeness relation and the orthonormality relation uh, where uh, you use the Haar measure to define some of these um, uh, integrals over uh, the group space. However, one can also think about uh, instead of position space, one can even think about the momentum space. So for SUN, the momentum space is basically the representations of SUN, right? So every irrep gives you a particular um, uh, Hilbert space, right? And this D is related to, of course, the position exactly like in the usual quantum mechanics. Um, in terms of uh, the irrep, uh, the representation uh, of G uh, in the representation irrep lambda, right? And that's exactly the connection between these two. And this D lambda is actually the dimension of the irrep, right? So there will be, in principle, a left and a right index. Both of them go from one to D lambda. And so that's the momentum representation. Uh, and again, the momentum space is also orthonormal and it satisfies the completeness relation where lambda is now summed over all irreps of SUN. And if, you've, if you think this is sort of the connection to the Peter Weil theorem of how one can write um, the states on, um, on the group space. Now, what we are going to propose is a qubit regularization. So we start with this traditional theory and the qubit regularization will just be a projection to some set of irreps. Notice lambda will only be a, a set of Q uh, in some set Q that I choose. And Q is the qubit regularization scheme. Now this Q can be chosen to be anything. And uh, in fact, you can show that if you project out in this momentum space, because it's uh, it's irreps of SUN, all the properties of the gauge theory are maintained. Um, so you don't lose anything, except that now you have a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And that's the way we think about the problem. So the quantum fields on each link uh, are, of, of course, there is the left generator of, of uh, gauge transformations. There is a right generator of gauge transformations. Then there is actually um, the link operator itself, which of course depends on which irrep you want to choose to think about. We usually think about uh, a fundamental representation or maybe an adjoint representation, but you can choose any lambda. Um, and so you can actually um, take these quantum fields, and this is sort of the way we define our gauge theory through these quantum fields. But then when you do a qubit regularization, what we're going to do is project out, right? You take your original yeah, uh, operator, right? L, R, or U, and then you project out into this particular subspace defined by this projector. Now with that, uh, you can show that all important symmetries of the lattice gauge theory are actually preserved. So for example, you can easily see this by understanding what, what is the link operator. A link operator is actually an eigen, uh, so the, uh, the position, position states are eigenstates of the link operator, and they just give the representation d lambda. Right? Uh, so these are d lambda by d lambda matrices. And these are, of course, uh, these are matrix of operators. These are just numbers. So that's what uh, we mean when we, uh, when we write the traditional gauge theory in terms of uh, these link matrices, right? So the dagger operator is just the star of this. So these are all in the position basis. So in the position basis, you can replace U lambda by just a matrix, 
But that's not true in the momentum basis. In the momentum basis, U lambda will have something more interesting that will happen. Now, the left and the right generators are very straightforward. The left generator multiplies G with the left um, group element. The right generator multiplies with the right group element. Uh, I introduce an H, H inverse so that when I construct my gauge invariance, it will all become straightforward. Um, and then using this property and the property of the link operator, we can actually show that um, basically the link matrices get multiplied by matrices um, in that particular representation lambda through the left and the right gauge transformations. And so one can use these properties to show what are the most important relations uh, that the traditional uh, lattice gauge theory operators obey. And all of these are preserved when you do the qubit regularization. Right? So you basically have uh, the original gauge theory, except in a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Now, the gauge transformations themselves um, are pretty straightforward. For example, if you take a site, there are links coming into the site, and we do the usual thing, right? So, for example, the site has one and two, there's a right part of one and two. And there's a left part of one and two, and the gauge transformation, which lives in SUN, is made out of these uh, generators. Now, gauge transformations on different sites commute. Um, and so one can basically label your full Hilbert space as a direct sum of Hilbert spaces, which are all irreps of G at every site, right? And so that then tells you um, a gauge invariant subspace, if you wish. So if the Hamiltonian commutes with all of G of X, then you have a gauge theory. And you can, you can sort of fix your uh, sector lambda X, which basically tells you all the irreps at every site. And that will be invariant under time revolution. So the full Hilbert space block diagonalizes um, into these subspaces with a given fixed lambda x. Now, of course, the Gauss's law then fixes a particular lambda x. And it's usually conventional to fix lambda x to be singlets. But as we will see, um, um, when it's staggered fermions, sometimes that is not the right um, physical space to pick. Um, then you will get Dirac fermions if you pick lambda x non-singlets. But that's like a background charge. You don't have to worry about it right now. But for the moment, we can imagine that lambda x's are singlets just for, or for the sake of argument. The physical Hilbert space will, of course, be projection into one of the lambda x's. Right? And so, um, and all of these features of the full Hilbert space and the, uh, the Gauss's law sectors, all of them emerge even in the qubit regularized theory. Now, let me now talk a bit about the simplest qubit regularization that um, my student and I proposed um, in the beginning of this year. So what we think, which is a very interesting and a simple representation for all SUNs, is to choose all anti-symmetric representations. Right? So this is the singlet. This is the fundamental. This is um, fundamental, two fundamentals in the anti-symmetric and so on. And there are n minus one. Um, anti-symmetric fundamentals. And now the, the interesting feature of this is that if I act with U, remember I told you that U is no longer diagonal uh, in this representation space because these are all momentum eigenstates. And so what happens is U actually uh, goes, uh, so if you act with one on U, you get this. With this, if you act on U, you get that and so on. So you, you basically cyclic in this in this language. And so you can actually work out all the details and you can actually compute U completely, at least for simple cases. Uh, and I'm sure uh, all of our results can be extended to SUN. So if you think in this language, you can think about what is the uh, link Hilbert spaces. So for example, for SU2, remember that uh, you have a one and just a fundamental. And this, uh, from the perspective of the gauge theory is actually a four-dimensional Hilbert space. Remember, it was d lambda. Lambda was the fundamental. 
there was ij and ing are going from one to two in this case so it's like a four dimensional hilbert space so this is five dimension so the hilbert space here is a five dimensional hilbert space for su3 it will be one this will be d of three ij ing will go over three and three so this will be nine dimensional and this will also be nine dimensional so this is 18 plus one 19 dimensional Hilbert space SU4, you can actually construct in the same way, and you can actually write down a complete expression for SU10. And so you have a, a, a complete characterization of what is the dimensionality of every local um, link Hilbert space. Now let's talk a bit about the gauge invariant subspaces. <clears throat> uh, we'll focus to 1D, and I will talk about higher dimensions later on. So let's take the simplest case of SU2. So in the SU2, remember, I have L sites, and I'm going to assume periodic boundary condition just for simplicity. You can keep them non-periodic if you need to. Uh, the full Hilbert space is very large, right? So on each site, it's two to the power N, which is four to the power L. And then on each link, I said for SU2, it was five dimensional. So it's 5 to the power L. So that's like 20 to the power L. That's the dimensionality of the Hilbert space. But that's the full Hilbert space. It's not the Hilbert space once you project out into the Gauss law sector. So let's say I want to project out uh, to the sector where every site is a singlet. Right? As I mentioned, this may not be the right thing with staggered fermions, but for the moment, let's just think if this was the thing we would like to do. So then what happens is that on each side, I have two link variable, two link um, Hilbert spaces and one matter Hilbert space, and all of them together should form a singlet. And in this case, it's pretty easy to write it down. For example, everything could be a singlet. In this case, remember the matter field, there were two singlets, um, the co completely fo uh, no particle Fock vacuum state, or both particles putting together the the two colored particles, both of them are singlets. So this is a two-dimensional Hilbert space, this is two-dimensional, and so this is a four-dimensional Hilbert space. Or, for example, you could have a, 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 a box here, a two a, a four-dimensional Hilbert space, a four-dimensional Hilbert space, but then you have to connect them such that it's a singlet, and you can only do it in a unique way. So there's a unique way in which these link uh, states are all coupled together, right, using the klebsch gordon coefficients. Uh, and then these are actually, again, singlets. Um, and so this is, again, a four-dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, for example, you could have maybe a doublet coming here. and But then a doublet cannot be gauge invariant all by itself. So there should be another doublet. So both should be doublets. And now there should be, there are two configurations. Either the link goes like this and a singlet there, or a link goes like this, and a singlet there. So these are the two one-dimensional representation, one-dimensional states. So totally, the Hilbert space in this case is 10. Right? So there are 10 uh, states which are with the matter, which are, are in the uh, gauge invariant subspace, or the once you, once you impose the Gauss's law, the dimensionality comes down to 10. Now you can do this in general, for L sites, you can actually work out the details and you actually get the, get the Hilbert space, the gauge invariant subspace to be just three to the power L plus one. It's a very clean way to sort of figure out what the gauge invariant subspace is. Now here I'm assuming everything is a singlet. All this calculation needs to be changed if you want to put in more, uh, more different lambda axes. We can do this whole thing for SU3, for example, and there, again, with L sites, each of them can be, remember, a singlet. There are two of those singlets or a three or a three bar on each side. So each of them, uh, you can then uh, combine with the links. And the local Hilbert space, of course, is two to the power three right? times uh, 19 to the power L. That's a huge Hilbert space. But that, again, is the full Hilbert space, which is not that interesting compared to the gauge invariant subspace. 
which in this case you can show is 4 to the power L plus 2. You can do the whole thing for SUN and you can characterize all the, all the gauge invariant uh, states. Right. So now in the 1D case uh, with matter in the fundamental representation, we've actually characterized the full Hilbert space completely. And the question now is, what is the Hamiltonian? And how do the Hamiltonians talk to each other? Uh, to, uh, that is connect different states in this uh, Hilbert space and what, are, what is the physics that's possible? And that's something that is currently under investigation. Now, but remember that the physical Hilbert space is quite interesting because it, it supports confinement and deconfinement. Even in 1D, both of these are possible. For example, just to think about an example in SU2, there could be a quark, a uh, two quark state, which is like a baryon, but then with a string, right? The baryon is formed because of the string, right? And then so by giving energetics to the string, I can make the baryon very loosely bound or tightly bound, right? So I can think about some kind of a deconfined baryon or a confined baryon. So all of this comes, of course, from the Hamiltonian. And what type of Hamiltonian will then describe this physics is something to think about and understand. Oh, Shailesh, you're running out of time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, but... yeah I, I'm done, almost done. Yeah. So you can actually do all this in higher dimensions. Um, uh, we can construct gauge invariant subspaces. And in fact, you can show that these constrained spaces can actually be sim uh, sampled very efficiently with worm algorithms. So for example, to give you an exa example in SU3, if you think about a honeycomb lattice, there are actually uh, four types of constrained bonds that one can write down, constrained sites that can write down. For example, you could have a baryon or an anti-baryon. There could be a loop going through it, or there could just be a singlet. Right? So these are the four sites. And then you write down all possible um, configurations with these constraints. And worm algorithms are very well suited to explore this Hilbert space. Quite crazy. So I think we have a control over what we can be doing. And now the question is, what type of Hamiltonians we have? Uh, what is the, uh, what are the various phases? Can we construct and study quantum critical points? And of course, the challenge is to understand if there are quantum critical points, what is the quantum field theory that emerges close to this quantum field? So with that, let me conclude. Uh, the qubit regularization is a new way of formulating and studying QFTs. The traditional Hamiltonians um, typically involve uh, infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but any Hamiltonian can systematically be regularized um, in a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, in this talk, I just showed you a simple regularization scheme for SU and lattice gauge theory and showed that there are very interesting Hilbert spaces uh, in, that, in that scheme. And then uh, the question, of course, is, what quantum field theories can arise from that. So let me stop that. Thank you. Thank you, Shailish. Let's give up. And now for questions. Hi, Shailish, one question. Sure. Uh, so this is regarding your uh, position and momentum variables. Uh, yes. So I'm wondering whether there is uh, something similar to the uncertainty relation. Could could one think of the, you know, what would be that? Uh, could be a silly question. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a it's a it's a natural question. Um, because since we are thinking about quantum mechanics of a particle on the on the manifold, right? You can the simplest example, of course, would be maybe SU2, but maybe even simpler could be even O3, right? So you put a Put a particle on the surface of a of a um, of a sphere, right? And then ask, uh, what is the uncertainty in position and momentum? And we know that already, right? So we know that every position, um, if you think about a position, you cannot talk about what is the angular momentum. So the angular momentum has all possible distributions. And then you think about a wave function in position that will have some set of angular momenta that are allowed. Uh, the qubit regularization tells you slightly differently to think about it in terms of the angular momentum rather than position. And that is, I think, the main difference between um, 
the traditional formulation, I think, in the qubit regularization, qubit regularized formulation. It thinks it says, think about angular momentum and say these are the only angular momenta allowed, right? And then that then um, some people call it the fuzzy sphere and things like that, that all possible positions are no longer allowed. And so the position is becomes fuzzy because only a few angular momentum sectors are allowed. And I think that same analogy extends to SUN, essentially. Okay, thanks. Okay, Richard. Shailesh, uh, greetings. Uh, beautiful, hey, present hey, beautiful presentation. I'm really disappointed that you're not here so that we could uh, go farther on the board. Uh, but you'd be sure, disappointed sir. if I didn't make a remark, I think. Uh, Sure. I think I think the basic structure, as you all know, is really identical to the um, quantum link problem. But you're seeing some new features, which are really interesting by sort of diving into the representation uh, approach. Uh, so I have one question, and that is, in the quantum link thing, in order to get from S U N to to U N to S U N, we had this added term. Do you have a different way to project down and get rid of the U1 sector from this language point of view? Yeah, that's a more interesting question that I uh, pushed under the rug. We discussed, uh, we discussed this a bit in the paper, um, uh, in, this, in this paper that I talked a bit about. Um, so what happens is that depending on the kind of projector that we have, right? Remember, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm projecting a particular Q sector. Right, yeah, yeah. There is usually, you have to then look at all possible um, algebra, right? The, the closed yeah, sure. algebra that it yeah, generates. Yeah. And usually there's always a U1 uh, gauge uh, hidden in that algebra, yeah, yeah, right. right? So you have to sometimes make sure your Hamiltonian breaks that. Otherwise, your Hamiltonian could have additional. So in principle, what I'm saying is, in this Q, once you project it to a particular Q sector, if you look at the algebra, you will usually have one more um, E, um, essentially an E operator that acts like a U1 gauge field. But, but I'm, so, I mean, particularly, we know how to do it in SU2, but we didn't have a way to do it in SU3. Is there a different way to do it in SU3, which is actually QCD? Um, even there, remember that we had the extra U1 and then you had this, um, we, baryonic we, operator that we wrote right. down. But we added wrote. it as a term in the Hamiltonian. Yeah, that's but all I'm saying. Put, the same thing you, will happen here. Also. You, but you can't, there's not a new kind of projection that can do it in a, in a, a what can say, a harder way or no? Yeah, that's a deeper question. I think yeah. what we have studied seems like there's typically yeah. always a U1 operator. Now, if you choose an adjoint representation, sometimes you can get rid of it. So this is a more Technical okay. Thing okay. Anyway, we, we should discuss that. I have one, okay. one other quick comment. Um, as you said, and this question is a well as a comment. Uh, you said, well, you know, bosons are, are hard to do with finite number of qubits. Of course, that's the icing model. It's exactly the example where it's five four three sure. truncated to a single qubit. So it's a classic example. Sure. So just for the student's sake, no, bosons are very easy. But I have a question here. Is it? But that's a special case. You know, we know go particular critical point. I'm sort of wondering, is there any case <laughs> where we can't find a universally equivalent formulation like the icing model or finite qubits, what everyone wants to say for the Hamiltonian, where we actually need a real field that, that you know, in some sense goes to infinity? I, I, I just wonder in physics, I, I, don't, I don't see yeah, any I, case. I think that's, that's a, I think it's folklore that we think we can do everything, right? But Actually, even for the O3 model, remember, it was not at all obvious how to do it with a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And what we found seems to work. Yeah, but uh, so, so I'm asking the, the op 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 maybe an impossible question. Have you ever found a case where you can't do it? <laughs> I, yeah, I for example, really... right now, this is a good question for the audience. I don't know how to do the O4 case. Uwe knows how to do CPNs. But yeah. I don't know what is O4 or O5, O O N, O-O-N, except really? for O3. Really? Can't you yeah. just do it in this flux basis? In this so basis? what we have done is we have found we have found that it's a good effective field theory. Yeah. Right. So that typically happens fine, right? That is something that comes from the D theory approach that we can actually increase the number of oh, I, I say the, the, the problem is you can't, you're not sure you get to the critical point. Is that the problem? 
critical point with a finite hilbert space that's not all not obvious at all okay. to me okay okay good well anyway as i said it's too bad you're not here because we could discuss this for hours and hours and i hope we can sure. meet soon uh, thanks a lot yep i don't want to take you. away other time any other questions Benjamin. Um, I'm, I think it's related to Richard's question. I would have expected that you, sh that you needed to uh, reintroduce the, the representations that you, uh, um, that you uh, abandoned. Um, I mean, if, if you just took the fundamental, would you get the CPN model from that? Because that's what I... So, um... So for the CPN model, um, who was, yeah, yeah. I, I guess maybe I'm. Let me let me understand your question. You're saying can we do the CPN model with a finite dimensional Hilbert space? Is that what you're question? Well, the but the way that I would think about it is that the the continuous variable CPN model would be the symmetrized uh, set of all fundamentals. That would be the representation space of the continuum. Uh, so can you get away with just doing the the fundamental and capture the CPN? So uh, CP1, which is O3, can be done by just the singlet and the triplet. So essentially, it's a four-dimensional Hilbert space. And we have written a paper on that, which, which we show, we at least to the extent we can see, we get back the universal function of the full O3 uh, uh, the infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Now, I believe that there is an extension of what we do to any SUN, and that will hopefully give us the CPN model. That would be my guess, uh, because that's all. That's what we do typically from uh, CP1 to CP2 and CP3 and so on. So I am hopeful, although I've not studied it, that any CPN could be done with a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Uh, maybe just add that in the comment. Yeah. Hello. I mean, as as Shilas Real knows, this is on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the usual thing of universality is get enough sy symmetries into place and hope the coherence gets you to the right theory. But it's always a dynamical question, right? So this is not easy. Shilas has found some really interesting cases of very few qubits that get to an asymptotically free theory. For uh, Uwe started with sigma models and did some very rigorous and good work on that, which sort of motivated this, but it's finally a dynamical question. And um, so maybe you need more than one rep, maybe two. There's some evidence uh, by Yannick that for the sort of XY kind of models, you need at least two representations, but whether there's a case where you need infinite and go back to the continuum is a dynamical question. Maybe just to follow up, why was the singlet necessary? Why couldn't weren't you able to get away with just the triplet for that CP1 model? Yeah, so somehow the triplet alone doesn't seem to work. Again, as Richard pointed out, it's a dynamical question. Maybe you can you can invent an interesting Hamiltonian and the critical point where it might emerge. But for us, we tried it, we couldn't get it. But then adding a singlet and a triplet definitely helps. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, if there's no more questions, let's thank Shailish again. Thank you, Shailish. Thank you, everybody.